Welcome to the Spiritual Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Beth, and I am so thrilled to introduce you to my special guest today. Her name is Beck Antonucci, and she is amazing. I'm just going to, you know, Beck, I'm just going to get right into your bio and read it because it's so powerful, and then we'll, well, then we'll talk. So, meet Beck Antonucci, a role model, thought leader, mentor, and also the host of the Raw, Real, and Vulnerable podcast. Beck is unfiltered, passionate about her work, and truly authentic, which is why I invited her to be a guest on my show. Beck has supported hundreds of women worldwide to break free from shame, break through unworthiness, activate their unique voices, and unlock their most confident, accepting, and authentic expression of themselves. Beck has made it her mission to touch the lives of millions of more women. Her podcast is for you if you are a stigma fighter, a shame slayer, a woman desiring to call in her aligned partner, or simply a woman sick of not showing the fuck up to her life as her true authentic self. Beck will take you behind the scenes into her world, her life, her relationships, her business, and give you a glimpse into what it actually looks like to say a big fuck you to our limiting beliefs, break free entirely from our societal stigmas, and live our full fuck yes life, alive, passionately, and on purpose from a heart aligned, unfiltered, and express space. Welcome to the show, Beck. I love your bio. I was like, that was so good. Where is that from? Who wrote that? Who wrote that? I only read the first paragraph. I wrote that for my podcast years ago. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for accepting my invite. I'm so excited that you're here. And we have so much to talk about. Um, First of all, I think, you know, we call this, we call the episode fuck stigma because I'm trying to remember how I first heard about you. And I, I think it was from a meme that a friend of mine sent me and I was like, who is this sassy, wild woman, unfiltered? I love her. And then, so I just got on your page and started following you and just been, I just love your work. And I just think it's so empowering what you do. So I'm going to let you go ahead and explain a little bit about your background to my viewers because they might not know what you do like I like I know. Yeah, um, well, I guess you could call me an emotional well-being coach or a confidence coach. I really support women to break free from any limiting beliefs that they hold about themselves so that they can cultivate the internal courage and worthiness to live their lives expressively, courageously, bravely. Um, I really believe that we're all put here to live our own committed lives of aliveness and alignment, whatever that uniquely looks like for you. And the limiting beliefs, the taboo part of what I do is I really talk very powerfully online about the herpes virus. So many people know me through that vehicle because it can show up for so many of us and it comes with such deep, deep, deep rooted shame and can activate so many of our wounds that have been repressed for so long but what I find super interesting is that the work that I do there it comes up for other women who come to me for other shames and limiting beliefs that aren't just herpes related or are not at all herpes related because none of us are free from the human experience and so we do the same work with the same woman it just shows up in a different vehicle which reminds me there's something that one of my mentors said to me when I was going through my own journey seven years ago is that what's most personal is most universal. So we can have these sorts and beliefs about ourselves that I'm the only one and the herpes virus can really do that and try and isolate us, which is essentially the role of the ego. But that's any woman that comes to me, she's going through that same ex- experience regardless of what has occurred in her life. I love that so much. That is so brave of you. Like I had never heard of anybody coming out and just telling the world, I have genital herpes. And I just think that's so powerful. And I know that Scott has has to help so many people. And for me, Mm. you've helped me so much just with like, with coaching too, because I think that we all start a little bit feeling like a little bit of an imposter at first. And, you know, just like, like, who the fuck am I to be telling (laughs) teaching people about life. I'm a life coach. I'm an expert life, but you know what? I I turned 50 this year and I I've been through so much and that is exactly what qualifies me. All of my mistakes, all of these things like that, that we've been through and, and came out the other side. That's exactly what qualifies us. You know, and of course we have the education too, but to me, the stuff that I've been through is so much bigger, so much bigger to go through like, 
As, so obviously I'm in the coaching industry. I'm in so many different coaching masterminds. I've got a whole community of coaches that I work with. And there's a very big difference between going and getting a certification and being great at holding facilitation with no heart, with no energy, with no ooh, like oomph to it, no life experience to infuse into it, no willingness to infuse your own personal life experience. That's one side of the coin. And then there's the other side of the coin of humans that have just gone through like the dark night of their soul and this thing that has occurred that's totally fucked them up, whether it's a breakup, a death, a someone's cheated or been cheated on, a stigmatized virus, something to do with sex and intimacy, body image, like just something that felt like it was taking control of your whole life and ripping it from you, from you. And you've gone through everything that you went through to come out the other side, to have all the tools, all the knowledge, all the life experience of what works and what doesn't work. And, and then you're able to deliver that. I feel it's so much more powerful. And even for myself, I just got back to Bali. I was in Perth, Western Australia for three weeks over Christmas. And when I left Australia uh, at the beginning of last year, there was this flat feeling that had occurred within me while I was there. And it was a sense of boredom. And I felt like, oh my God, I'm just this person sitting in my office talking to the internet. And I'm just like, repeating information I'm not in I'm not a life coach I'm not living my life when I went back to Perth that same feeling landed as soon as I got back to Bali I was like oh I'm in integrity now I'm in congruence with what I teach because I'm fully claiming my life and when I'm not doing that I don't feel I have any right to support women to live their lit up aligned lives and I'm not doing it for myself I love that. That's and, and that's like I was listening to one of your episodes actually today, and um, it's just the one that popped up for me. And it was with your best friend Tracy Callahan. Is that how am I saying her yeah. name right? And it was about how to follow your desires and and how to know the difference between intuition and you know like something that she said was really important is the voice of knowing is never fear based, and that's so important for. You, do you want to expand on that at all? Like when when people for to help people discern. Like, how do we know if it's our intuition, like telling us either something is good or bad? How do we discern yeah. that? You know, um, this is so relevant for me because when I went back to Perth, my I, the reason I moved to part of the a part of my move to Bali was I actually broke up with my partner of three years, mm. and I had a beautiful partner, like a man that treated me so well, best friends, same values, just like we have a very um, sweet and beautiful and almost. I don't want to give it this word because it feels a little bit condescending, but acute, just like, just yeah. like the most loving, adorable relationship. But there was just something that was missing for me and I knew it was, but it's so hard to break up with someone and yeah. to disconnect from someone that you love so much or to leave a relationship that isn't, I'm doing air quotes right now, bad where neither, where you two love each other so much. I find that so challenging because so um, many of us are great at calling it quits when something's bad, right? Like, you've hurt me, you've harmed me, you've betrayed me, you've lied to me, then see you later, you're not in alignment with my values. But when someone is and something's just missing, that was really hard. And hard. the voice that kept coming up for me was, it's not Jake. And that, that was always the first voice when I'd be like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Do I stay in Perth? Do I try and make it work with Jake? Because I went back to Perth and we tried to rekindle. And the same thing happened of like, I know you want it to be Jake, Rebecca, but it's not Jake. And the voice afterwards, so my first voice would be, it's not Jake. That's the voice of intuition. That's the voice of truth. That's the voice of knowing. And she wasn't, she wasn't erratic. She wasn't loud. She wasn't hurtful. She wasn't berating. She wasn't charged. She was just like gentle and just like dignified and loving and knowing of like, Rebecca, it's not Jake. The next voice that would always come in, and I've been going through this for a year and a half in this breakup is, but I want it to be. And so that's the difference between intuition and fear. That's like the intuition knows, the heart knows the truth. And then the personality mind is like, but I've got, I've got the partner. He treats me well. We can make this work. The piece is missing. We can go and do a course. We can get a coach. We can do something to get the missing piece for us. But the truth was just like, no, Rebecca, your heart is telling you he is not your husband and the father of your children. And so that's, if that tangible, like real life example helps, that's what I believe when that is very true. The first voice will be very knowing. Every other voice, because the voice of knowing, uh, it can come with a lot of, there's some brave decisions that get to be made on the other side of the knowing voice. Maybe it's like, 
need to start a podcast or you're going to be a life coach or you this job is not for you. Whatever it is, comes with a lot of courageous act that needs to happen to align with that voice. So every other voice afterwards is trying to convince you out of it. That makes so much sense. And yeah, I, I remember reading that on your Instagram about, about Jake, about your the three-year relationship. And that is so relatable to me because that's happened to me where the person didn't do anything wrong. They were such a great guy, you know, and it is, it's harder. It's almost like you want them to do something <laughs> to help push you over that fence, right? Because you kind of are like a little bit in, a little bit out. And, and yeah, we can't manufacture certain things. We just can't manufacture chemistry. We can't manufacture true love and intimacy. It's either there or it's not, no matter, it doesn't mean the person's not a wonderful person, maybe one of the best people in the world, but it also doesn't mean it's our, our perfect match. Um, I think that's what I commented on your thing was like, it, you know, it doesn't mean we're looking for a perfect person. We're just looking for the perfect match for us. That's all. Yeah. And, and if he, it, and he sounds like a perfect match for a, a wonderful, beautiful, deep friendship. Yes. Mm-hmm. I know when we were saying goodbye, we spent like our last night crying and I was just like, can you cheat on me or punch <laughs> me or do something that would make this easy when the person is just like, leaving someone that I really love. It's, it's yeah, hard. there's love there. Yeah. Yes. As so many women have connected with me about it saying, this was my marriage for 15 years. This was my, I had three kids to a person like this. And finally I set us free. I like always tried to fabricate this missing piece. We both loved each other so much that we were, Jake and I committed to growth. So mm. he's, we can grow in this area and so a part of me was like well all my friends talk about they just want a man that's going to sit in front of them and say we can grow and I've got that but then I was like hold on that's coming from limitation as well because I know what my standards and my values are so any man that I attract into my life is going to have a value for growth and then I just had to tune into my own beliefs about God that if I'm not meant to be in Perth and he is then maybe the piece that's missing isn't something that can be worked on and grown into because my mission is elsewhere and that piece had to not be there to make sure that I leave. And not not yeah. Jake himself, but the place. That's that's so true. And yeah, because like lifestyle and values and where you're going to live, people don't talk about those things a lot in the beginning of a relationship. It's like the most important things. If, if at the end of the day, I want to live by the ocean and, and you want to live in the, you know, in the country or in the mountains, why even get started? Because in a relationship, like there's really important questions. Oh, you don't want to have kids and I want kids. Like, why don't people talk about that stuff on the first date? I, I think it's it's absolutely necessary so we don't waste each other's time, truthfully. Yeah. And I mean, I turned 36 this year. So Jake and I were together the year I turned 32, 33, 34. So from age 31 and just referencing the herpes piece, because I know that was a part of what we were going to talk about. Yeah. I've gone through so much fear around the herpes virus and I was single for seven years mad at men very mad Jake was my first boyfriend after that and Um, he being so in alignment with my values so accepting so loving such a stand for me I didn't want a boyfriend I was never in this like I want a boyfriend place I still had a lot of fear around being chosen and a man I thought a man would have a lot of embarrassment about how loud, proud, out there on the internet I am, but Jake's not like that at all. He's like, I don't give a shit what people think. You put your stake in the ground, you claim what you're here to go and get. You go and talk about this thing and save some lives. And I'm like, yeah, I love this. I I know, he's so great. And so that's what I love. But because I I was not, at 31, I wasn't thinking, what's your vision? What are your, what are you here to, what's your financial vision? What are we, what are we creating together as a couple And then at the age of 35, this past year, it's really landed. Like 35 and 30 feel very, very different ages. Now I'm like, actually, I'm not dating to fuck around. I like, you're going to, whoever, if I'm dating, it's because I think that you may be the husband of my, the father of my children, my husband. It's intentional dating. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it almost, you know, it was great. Jake is like, it's like you grew up in a year, but I did where all of a sudden I was like, no, I I know what I want for my life and I can't not have that. So Mm -hmm. even when I went back to revisit, he came back to me a month before I went back to Australia for Christmas and said, I want us to work on this. I just went super logical for a moment of like, 
Okay. My heart and my mind are going to try and convince me into things, but I also need to put on paper the vision. I know what I want for lifestyle. That's really important to me. I know what I want for sex and intimacy. That's really important to me. I know what I want for love and relationship, finances, motherhood and marriage. And I wrote like two pages on each. And I said to him, I'm going to bring you a vision for what I am here for, for my life. And he was like, I'm going to do the same. And I brought it to him so that he could see, because if he's a, I love you, but lifestyle, we don't align, then I know how important that is to me. So it can be yeah. like, I can try and get in that war of like, I want it to be Jake. I don't want it, I would, but it's not Jake. I could play that out, which I did. But then I also had on paper what I can't settle for. I brought him sex and intimacy, two pages. He brought me three sentences. And that was like the missing piece for me, right? Where I brought him two detailed pages of what I'm holding the vision for that I know I can't live without. It like deepens the roots of relationship within me and it makes me feel so certain that some of it he was a yes to and some of it he was like, that's a lot and I don't know. <laughs> like maybe I could grow into that, maybe I can't. It doesn't feel like a huge desire for me. And that to me was the crystal clear clarity. But when I was 31, I wasn't thinking that. It right. took for me to sit here to really be like, no, I'm going to take full ownership and claim my life my desire, I know we were going to reference that on this episode. These are my desires that if I settle on them, I'm going to be so, I cannot live without it. And that supported me. Yeah. And, and I acted like I'm this big, was this big expert my whole life about that. I've been divorced twice <laughs> and this is why I know the stuff, you know, of course, from yeah. my relationship um, certifications, of course, helped me realize, oh, that's, that's where I fucked up back then. Um, so yeah, I, these are the things that I didn't do either. And then now I know, but I, like I said, I've turned 50 this year. So, I mean, it's it's like, I should know by now, of course, right? I've made the mistakes already. And so, yeah, I, I definitely, when I was in my early thirties, no, <laughs> I didn't know that either. Like now I know what to ask. Now I, I teach people what to ask, but that's a, it's a, it's a, there's a learning curve. Yeah. So there was something you said that was really cool too. Uh, you guys were talking about um, expectation. Mm. And in the and the way that you were saying it was about, and I've said it in, in a way with gestation and pregnancy, like we don't want, you know, when we're pregnant, we don't want that baby to be born too early. And the way you guys talked about it on that episode was about flowers and our expectation of when we plant the flowers. And do you remember that conversation at all? And is it the seed around transformation and wanting it to grow yes. faster? Yes. I thought that was so beautiful. I wanted you to tell my viewers. Yes. I, you know, women will come to me. Oh, even I had a client, I've got a new client who's just started with me and she's come out the gate so hard, so fast, like steam rolling ahead. All her friends like, what are you doing? She's referring me to everyone. Not everyone goes this way, but she's like, she's gone this way. And so now She's like, I'm doing all this work and like, I want to, I want to see the results like immediately, 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 immediately. And I said to her, transformation is like the expectation around doing the work today, whatever the work is, whether it's business, hers is specifically related to business and money, whether it's relationship, whether it's your own relationship with the self, whether it's going to the gym and working out after a few months of not and like, oh, I went to the gym and I ate a salad today, where are my results? And we're basically... <laughs> what I when when it comes to the inner work, I imagine each day that I'm planting seeds, and every day that I continue to revisit the work, whether it's on my business, on my relationship, on whatever domain it is, on my physical body, every day that I return to it, I'm plant, I'm watering that seed. But just to do something one day and then to be standing over the seed, it's like you and I go and plant a seed today, and then tomorrow morning we come back and we're both standing there and we're screaming at this seed like. Bro, like, <laughs> grow, motherfucker, grow. Where are you? Where's the, where's my flower? And the seed's like, you just planted me yesterday, like literally yesterday. I need to like sprout. And my roots need to go down, and then I need to come up. And it's gonna it's gonna be a whole journey. And I feel that's where we can really rob ourselves of the beauty of the journey of life. We want it all now. We want like, I don't want to go through the breaking up with Jake again. And now um, the, I'm like, even though it's not in, like as charged as us, I'm like, oh, it's going to be dating and getting myself back out there. And it's exciting and beautiful. But I'm like, oh, my seed and my flower had just been Jake, but it wasn't. 
And it's almost like trying to scream at the flower, like grow. Like if Jake's not my husband and I'm screaming at Jake, you're my husband, it's not going to make the flower. I can't turn a pink rose into a sunflower. Right. You know, the flower is the flower and it's going to grow at whatever time it's going to grow. We don't grow. We don't water our garden and then be like, it didn't grow to the height and the length and on the exact day that I wanted that flower to flower. It just Mm -hmm. grows. We just water it. Yeah. And how are we humans any different? Yeah. And we don't want to, if when we're pregnant, we don't want that baby to be born prematurely. It's not ready. It's got a, we, there's a gestation period. And like you said, enjoy the journey. That's the, that's life. Because as soon as we, and I know, you know, this, and as soon as we reach a goal, that is, it's, it's very short lived that excitement. And then we're, we, we set a new goal. If we're, if we're passionate people anyway, you know, I, I mean, we're still happy, but I think that we're always meant to be growing and evolving and that's the way it's supposed to be, you know? So enjoy that journey because that's, you're supposed to have fun along the way. It's not just, you don't wait to be happy uh, to, re- when, to when you reach your goal. You're, 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 you should be enjoying the process, right? Yeah, and the, I mean, we should be, but the truth is we're all, we're all on our journey wanting to get to like the top of the mountain fast. <laughs> and I don't think many of us are like, I'm just totally at peace with exactly where I am. Like even in my business, there's a part of me that feels I should be further ahead than where I am, even though I'm doing brilliantly. And whenever I have that voice come up, it's just like you haven't built the body yet that can hold the bigness of what you're creating. Mm. And so that because I've I went really fast out of the gate in my in my coaching business. I've had businesses prior, but this one I came really fast out of the gate. And in the second year, I invested in two mentors, two business coaches that were absolutely crap. I basically like burned money for a year. Wow. I've done that. Literally. Yes, um, and many of us have. As if you feel like the life path of eights, or my friends are like, "What's your numerology chart?" But I literally like grabbed, and I'm not talking. Your about life path is eight. Yeah, mine too. Um, so we, you've definitely done the same thing as me. I right? definitely burn money. Yeah, yeah, and I, I gra- like not a small amount, and in my second year, just like basically grabbed it, burned it mm. on wild, crazy things. I could tell you how it happened, and at the end of that year, I was like, "How did that happen?" And for me, it was like I hadn't built the energetic body that could hold the bigness of what I'm calling in. So who's to say if I went faster or I created what I feel like I'm here to create and it was here tomorrow, who says that I could create it and hold it? Who says that, who says that I'm ready for the husband yet? He's I'm obviously not because he's not here. I had to go through sure. all the lessons that Jake that was involved in mine and Jake's relationship to prepare me for what's to come. But if we're, if what's to come is not here yet, it's because we're in the preparation phase. Right. We're getting like, are you familiar with Abraham Hicks at all? Yeah. So we're like getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready. And then, you know, that's what, that's what the relationships are about. Sifting and sorting through this, you know, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. And and sometimes we don't know. Well, almost always we don't know what we want until we experience what we don't want. So it gave you it gave you data points. And now, you know, the way law of attraction would work, since I teach law of attraction would be, well, you just focus on those positive aspects. Jake seemed to have tons of positive aspects to focus on. And then you'll manifest that in your next relationship. Plus, all the things that you learned that were a contrast won't be there, you know, with your with your next person. So it's always improving and growing. And um, that's that's how we learn through um, what we don't want. Something else that you guys talked about that I really loved is um, you were talking about staying small versus um, being open to receiving desires. And a lot of it was to do with societal and like family conditioning and, and like how that can kind of tend to hold us back because we've got this voice in our head, the, the programming, right? Where it's like, but I should be happy. Do you want to go into that a little bit and elaborate? Yeah, I, I think we as women can... Uh, show up to life. Well, I don't think it's feel. I feel as women, we show up to life based on so many things that were said to us as little girls that we still hold as true in our body. Maybe your mind doesn't remember. There's explicit, implicit memory. Explicit is uh, is something that has occurred. Uh, explicit memory is something that happens that I'm going to remember. Implicit is something that's happened where my body remembers. Maybe mm. I don't have cognitive thought around that thing that occurred. Now, some of the memories and traumas that we hold are about money and things that the 
programming our parents have put into us, like you get what you're given. Well, imagine if you're running around your life with a belief system that says you get what you're given. Let's hope people are giving you some pretty great stuff. Right. Or be grateful for what you have. Other people have it worse than you. Um, I think all of us could, money doesn't grow on trees. Dad doesn't have enough money for that. Whatever it is, fill in the blank for what you were told as a little girl around being grateful for whatever it is that you have. Other people have it worse, the children in Africa, all the things. And so then we're, you know, women in our 30s, 40s that are walking around not feeling fulfilled by life, running a program that doesn't serve us, completely unaware that that's the program that we're running because that's what we've been told to hold as little girls. And so until we do the work to unlearn what we were taught, we can't learn something new. So Tracy and I play this out in just even the microest of ways. If I get a glass that I don't like to drink from, I'll ask the waiter to take it back and bring me out the glass that I like. Mm -hmm. If I, if something happened, just even if there's something that occurs at a dinner where I'm like, that isn't the exact way that I desire it. And there's a part of me that's like, oh, just, it's fine. Like that, like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's that it's fine. Don't worry about it. That I pick up and actually give a voice to because I've seen in my relationships where like the micro has occurred where I say, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. When actually all of those are mounted on top of each other become a big, well, now I'm really concerned about it. Now this is a problem, but it's all attached to the woman not using her voice when she notices it's fine. Don't worry about it. And the part of us that says it's fine. Don't worry about it is probably a part of the self that was taught. Just be grateful for what you've got. Just right. like you're at dinner, you're in Bali. It's a glass. Like who cares? It's the same water, no matter if it's a tall glass, a short glass, a glass with ice, a glass with lime. Just be, just be grateful, Rebecca. And I won't play that out anymore. I had to learn. I, I, I'm a former people pleaser as well. And it's so liberating to finally, yeah, because we're taught like to, to be the good girl. You know, don't speak up, don't rock the boat. Um, you know, just just to smile and nod a lot. And 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 the thing that you said is like little by little that chips away at your soul. <laughs> and then we build resentment, like especially in a relationship, because we never and it's inauthentic. We're being inauthentic as people pleasers. And that's that's the, the biggest reason to ditch it is because we're not really the nice people that we might be appear trying to pretend to I be. Wouldn't fully, I wouldn't fully call that people pleasing though. I would I would because that's not pleasing another person. That's just self abandoning you. Like I don't resonate with being a people pleaser or a form of a former people pleaser. Oh. Even oh, I, I used to tell life. people what they wanted to hear in a relationship. Like I wouldn't, I would, I was a conflict avoider, which made me a people. And, and so that was just a me story then. Yeah. But I would, I would definitely. And so I wasn't being authentic because I wanted to avoid conflict. It was more important. So I, so I didn't say what I was really thinking. Then I build a bunch of resentment. Right. And then that's not good. So I don't do that shit anymore. This was, this was the old me. For the, the people pleaser and or the woman that doesn't communicate her needs, they both, it will, end up reaching the same point of resentment. Like mm -hmm. the other day, for example, I ordered, I never remember now, I ordered sparkling water with ice, no lime. I don't like the lime rind in my drink in Bali. And so they bring it out with ice, they pour it, there's lime in it. And so I'm just like, I have to send that back because I don't want the lime in my drink because my unmet needs, when I don't advocate for myself and speak up for myself, when I see the lime and I'm like, oh, I didn't want that. And then I don't say something about it. What then happens is I'm like, oh, there you go, Rebecca, not speaking up for yourself when you're literally not receiving what you desire. And now when that shows up in relationship of like, oh, I know I want him to do this, but I don't want to say it. But uh, well, what he's done is good. So I'm meant to just be praising the man because that's what they yeah. say about the energetics of polarity. But I'm really not happy with what's been done. And that's not really what I wanted. And he's like, so then I end up building resentment. So all these micro ways are the way in which I teach women and myself to use our voices yes. and advocate for our needs because a, a woman who does not resents herself. And you just said, you said self abandonment. That's very, very true. Very important. That's what, that's quite literally what you're doing when you don't voice what you really want and try to get your desires. So, um, yeah, you guys were talking about also like, um, like moving 
to Bali, right? And so yeah. Tracy had this sensible, like she was had this conflict of the sensible quiet life versus a life of pur purpose and passion. And then she mentioned, and this is so true, that we have to go through when we do decide to take that leap and, and live a life of desire, we have to go through a grieving process for the old life. Yes. And I thought that was like, it's so um, important, like we just kind of letting go, letting go of attachments that we had to any, or, or, and also belief systems, which is really hard. Do you have any like suggestions? Cause a lot of those are subconscious, meaning like ingrained and programmed. Do you have any suggestions on how people can get through that grieving process and let go of all those attachments to old beliefs? Yeah, I don't think there's an easy way to let go of <laughs> attachments, but grief, I mean, I think grief is the one emotion that you can't run and hide from. You can run from, you can suppress happiness and sadness and anger and joy, but you can't mask grief and it will hit you like a ton of bricks. So I really believe that the only way out is all the way in and through. Mm. And so you know, I, I'm, I have to now grieve Jake and the relationship of Jake and, and that, and everything that that encompassed. Yeah. I have, I get to grieve and I already did the part of me that was, you know, in, in a living environment in Perth, Western Australia and everything yeah. that encompassed for women that come across my path that uh, on the receiving end of a stigmatized STI, what they don't realize is the day that you walk into that doctor's office and walk out with that information and know this thing about you is really true. You're grieving the STI free version of you. And so yeah. when I thought how to be with, we think death is just my granddad died, but there's so many cycles of death and rebirth that occur in, in our lives that we're just not taught how to be with that. And that's why it can feel really all consuming because we just don't know how to be with grief. And for me, I work with tools like grieving ceremonies and cord cuttings and forgiveness. And they're the kind of like tangible tools that I support women to work with. But we just can't. It's the one thing that we can't not feel. Like I have to feel the sadness of Jake not being a part of my life. And right. I have to feel the fear attached to that as well. And, the, and the, the, the grief that's attached to losing a best friend. It's the only way for me to go all the way in and come all the way out. Did you say you're with him? Did I hear you say that, that you're with him every day for three years? Like, I thought you said that in the podcast episode, but maybe, maybe I misheard. Like, I was like, wow, she was with him. That'd be really, that it's really hard to leave. If you were like, we were physically with each other every day. Probably talk every day. I would say, I would say most of a good night for you multiple times throughout the day. So we've definitely been in, in contact every single day. Um, I, I took, you know, I, I went traveling for seven or eight weeks, went to Europe for a month. But so those times we weren't together, but most days in that we were from September, 2020. To, yeah. Most days. You're, you're cutting out just a little bit, but I think I heard everything. So um, do you have any, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to talk about the ad addiction and stuff. I thought you'd mention something about, cause I definitely, so I had a let go of my addictions. I had alcohol, like I abused alcohol and I uh, definitely had like, and, and I feel like it's really hard to meet people who don't usually have both like alcohol and food, food disorders of some kind. <laughs> usually they go hand in hand for, for the people I know anyway. Um, so I had it like had both of those. Do you, did you have to, did you, did I hear you say you had anything to do with like food addiction or anything like that? Or, or did I mishear about I don't that? resonate with the word addiction. I did have a disorder, uh, eating disorder. Disor oh, that was what it was. Yeah. Um, so that was probably a, beyond uh, the herpes journey. Disordered eating was a really tough one to overcome because it's so uh, attached to our core wounding that I didn't understand. I had no, I, I, and then also because it was food, I thought the solution would be food and fitness. It was so emotional that I didn't realize it was healing trauma and understanding how to process and move my emotions out and through my body. I even, when I was in the gym yesterday, I was thinking, uh, I'm not hungry. I used to be hungry all the time. Like the more that I do work on myself, Sometimes I'm like, you need to eat, like eat, eat some food, not from like, a, I'm not eating food, 
but just from a, I don't get the sensation of being starved yeah. because I don't need to stuff down my feelings because I'm so willing to be with them. But before, you know, I would restrictive diet, then I would binge eat. I would not understand. I would eat just a, the most insane amounts of food, the shame spirals on the other side of like this compulsion to just eat and eat and not be able to stop. And when you're a compulsive eater or when you're a binge eater or you you, uh, experience bulimia, whilst you're eating, you never feel satiated. Nothing ever feels delicious. But once you've almost like ripped the lid because you've restricted your food for so long and you've basically thrown like thrown all your toys out of the uh, out of the pram for example you're now try because you know that you've basically fucked your diet yeah. you're now trying to, you try you're now in this desperate i need to try and find the thing that i'm going to eat that will make this all worth it that tastes delicious enough delicious enough for me to have gone through the pain that i'm about to encounter and nothing ever would and it would be an awful vicious cycle that could go for hours and up to months mm. Yeah. And, and I can relate to that. Um, a lot of what you said, I wasn't, I wasn't ever bulimic, but I would do something weird called deading. Have you heard of deading? It's just, it's a term. So basically like you eat something and then you like you, you, you get on the treadmill and run it off. I got to burn all these calories, you know, like, so it's, it's, it's a form of, it's like, it's instead of actually, you know, throwing up or something, you're just like exercising it off instead. So like I couldn't get myself to to throw up or anything, but I would do deading. That's what, that's the term for it. And so, yeah, I appreciate you talking about that because that's, you know, that's exactly what, um, people need to hear is that once you work on yourself, once you work on, you know, the emotions and you learn to sit with your feelings, like you said, that, that those cravings, you know, it, it helps them go away because you're no longer trying to stuff down your emotions. You don't have that void to fill. In other words, like there's usually a void that we're trying to fill some emptiness. Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of work. This is something that we do in all of my programs, supporting women to cultivate a deep sense of self-trust. But I would have been one of those people that would say, I can't put chocolate in my fridge. I can't put snacks in my pantry. I can't like I, I can't put ice cream in the freezer because I won't like I won't trust myself to not eat like the entire thing. And once I've had a little bit, the rest of it's going to be gone. But now, um, like I love the Indonesian Kit Kats. I don't know if it's they're a slightly different flavored chocolate to the Australian ones or just because they're on the shelf and they're room temperature. So they're almost like slightly melted, but it's so delicious. But I can go and get as many of them as I want. And after I've had one, I just know that I'm complete. Like I've, I've experienced, I've got, uh, I've done all my standards for food as well. And it's important to me that I feel pleasure whilst I'm eating. I have a beautiful relationship with food. Now I really want to enjoy my food. And if I'm going to experience, I know that guilt is one of the lowest vibrational frequencies we can live from. If I look at something, if I'm out for dinner, I'm like, Oh, I think I want that. Oh no, maybe I shouldn't. As soon as I have that, I might, if there's a thought that I could feel guilty after eating the thing, I will not choose to eat the thing. Yeah, because you won't have peace about it. And you shouldn't really do things that you don't have peace about because it's, it, it, even if it's fine, it's not fine for you. You've, you've, yeah. you've fucked up the vibration. <laughs> yeah. And I think, that, you know, I've, I've gone through such a journey with my body and with my relationship with food to get it to here now. It's just been a long road. And now it's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely don't think that I've ever gotten there. Um is with addiction, I'm, I'm better at being an abstainer than a moderator. Like I just have never been able to master moderation. So it's easier for me to abstain. There's actually a saying um, that um, St. Francis, I believe said, it's per, um, abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. And I could moderate for some time, but eventually I'm going to screw it up. You know, like I, I, I like eat, that's how it was with alcohol. And then that's why I got to that point where I finally was like, I don't ever want to risk d- overdoing it again. So I just, it was easier for me. It wasn't ever worth the trade off anymore. And then I knew too much about it. it just messed with my vibration and messed with my sleep. You know, I, I was very functional. Like I started two businesses, you know, it wasn't like I was rock bottom, but I had a lot of dark nights, <laughs> put it that way. Like, and, and, and the shame and the guilt spiral, like you talk about, like, that's just so low. And I'm not, I was no longer setting myself up to have a good day the next day. And I, you know, I, I made a decision. So it's been like four and a half years since I've had alcohol and I'm, I don't, I don't miss it. Cause I drank for over three decades. <laughs> I had, but, 
I had my fill. I'm good. And, you know, it didn't, it just wasn't making me feel good anymore. And also was messing with my hormones and it's like, just not, just not worth it. I'm not, yeah, see, I'm very much the opposite of abstinence for me. Really you can moderate. Good. Yeah, I can moderate, but I don't have, so I, the sugar was my thing. It wasn't any other food. It wasn't takeaway. It wasn't pizza. It wasn't burgers. It was always sugar, chocolate, mm. chocolate, all these, those kinds of things. But an alcohol, I'm just like, I've never had a, I don't have a, I don't like being drunk. I've never liked being drunk. Really? So I can have one red wine and enjoy it. I can have, we went out for my sister's birthday on the weekend. I had one drink, you know, so okay. for me, yeah. I, can, I can have one or two drinks. And when I was younger, because my father was so controlling, so freedom has always been something that I've ached for. Mm-hmm. Um, when I started drinking alcohol, I would go from sober to drunk without a journey to get there. I would just wake up the next day and have no idea what happened. This is obviously when I'm a teenager and in my young twenties. And so some really like silly and, you know, quite what could have been very dangerous things could have happened in those times where I got myself so drunk. And then there was a lot of shame waking up the next day, wondering what happened last night, having someone repeat the night to me. So I've just had such a low value for alcohol and getting drunk since then. That's so s- smart and sensible of you. Yeah, I, I had a lot of those nights and can, it's very relatable to where the, the shame and the not remembering stuff. But yeah, I didn't quite figure that out like the, like you did as a teenager. That's that's pretty good that you were just like, okay, no more of that. And then you were able to control it. Yeah, that's I guess that's the oh, difference. No, it, took me, it took me until my third, like, I think I stopped getting drunk, silly drunk from like age 25. Oh, okay. And that's still really good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I think really good. I, I think alcohol, just alcohol has just never been my thing. I just always knew with alcohol, recreational drugs, plant medicines, all the things. I, I really just believe God gave us all the toys of life to play with. And as long as you have control over it and it doesn't have control over you and you know what has control over you and you don't, then right. toy, feel good. But for me, I was always like, if God told me tomorrow you can't drink alcohol, you can't do drugs, you can't do plant medicines, I'd be like, okay, cool. I'm happy with my sparkling water and my chicken salads. And so that, that's just the relationship that I have with that thing. And that I knew that chocolate was the thing that had control over me. So that's what I had to recreate a relationship with. Yeah, I love that. And chocolate for me is definitely something that um, I would, I, another th- sugar, I, I, I just, I just don't even get started because I had that thing once I'm good at abstaining. And then once I get started, it's all thrown out the window and, and I'm a foodie in general. I love all food. Like they're like, like just so I, it's, 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 you can't just like alcohol. You can just quit drinking alcohol. You can't eat, quit eating food. <laughs> that was a part of my disordered eating where I was like, why can't I be a drug addict or an alcoholic so I can just call turkey this motherfucker? <laughs> you can't abstain from food. That's so funny. So, um, do you think this is a question that I had written down because I, my whole life had this, I'm very unfiltered as well, just naturally always been that way. Like kind of, I had to learn even like before I became a coach, like to kind of, you know, have a better delivery. Do you think, do you think the way we tell our truth, you know, matters? Like, do you think, or do you, do you think it's okay to just be completely authentic and just fuck it? I'm going to say exactly what I mean. Or do you, do you ever censor yourself? Because I'm kind of back and forth on that because it feels good to just be completely free. But then also, I guess we got to worry about people's feelings. <laughs> Have a nice soft delivery. Um, I mean, it really depends what the intention of my communication is. Uh, so if I'm being funny, I'm being funny. If That's I'm true. expressing something that is, um, it, that is I, I think it's beautiful to have a spectrum. Like I know, for example, when I'm facilitating my groups, I know what the, the flow and the the energy and what I'm infusing into that. When I'm expressing online, if there's, it really depends what my intention of the communication is. I'm not like, I'm going to write a, a funny joke to hurt so many people's right. feelings. It's like <laughs> a part of comedy is that we're a bit brash, right? Right. And, Absolutely. That, that's very- what makes me laugh the most is like the dark stuff or the, um, you're, yeah, and- we, we share the same sense of humor, you and I. So that's, that's why I, I definitely was like, that's why I was like, 
is there even a line? I guess we need to know our audience too. Like it's important to know, like, cause some people are more sensitive. Well, can I be really honest? Mm -hmm. I couldn't give a shit. Really? Okay. That was kind of my question. Cause that's how I felt. And I'm, like I said, I'm well, back and forth on that. I'm going to tell you why. I'm not going to curate my Instagram and my self-expression so that you will like it and like it. And this engage is, with it. I love like, it. <laughs> because my, my mentor said this to me years ago. If you are your most authentic, like I was so scared about talking about herpes on the internet. I was like, I don't want to talk about herpes. No one's going to like me. Everyone's going to hate me, all the things. And I'd spent years creating. I mean, I didn't, I don't even have a big Instagram now, but I'd spent years building my first 10,000 followers. And it was from sexy gym photo shoots. I was like the gym girl with the lingerie and the three kilo dumbbell doing a tricep extension <laughs> with some, and like my mouth pouted, all the sweat over me and the oil, all the things. So I had built my audience on Fitspo pictures, quotes, and motivational crap. I didn't know that. Yes. All I wanted to be in my disordered eating journey is I wanted to be a fitness model. And so I'd done bodybuilding and bikini modeling and all the things. And I had, that's why I had the abs. Then I'd put on the 20 kilos and I'd have the abs again. And it was a real, it was a whole thing. Anyway, I was like, I'm about to start talking about herpes and body dysmorphia and disordered eating. Like I never wanted anyone to know, even though I'm sure it was more than obvious that sometimes I had abs and sometimes I gained 15 to 20 kilos because you can see it. But I said to Preston, my mentor, I'm like, I'm going to start talking about authenticity and vulnerability and herpes. And these people are following me for like a push up and a squat and me in short shorts. <laughs> it was like everyone who doesn't align with your message, which there's going to be a lot of people, they're going to go. They're going to go. And it's going to create so much space for all the people that are going to come. And so that just stuck with me forever of like, why? I like making jokes. I even think herpes jokes are funny. I used to not. They used to kill me. I would have been so mad at someone. But I'm connected to the energy that I'm putting out there, the intention. And a part of what I teach is full self-expression and full ownership. I'm not like, let's write something mean on the internet today to piss some people off. Right. That's not of what I'm sharing, but I'm not here to cult to curate for you. I love that. No, that's perfect. That's what I thought you were going to say. And that's why I asked, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of was hiding for a long time of my, cause I'm, you know, people call me woo woo. Cause I'm into all this spiritual stuff and I teach law of attraction and all that. And then now, and then I came out with a podcast. This is a new pod, like a spiritual transformation podcast where I have people who channel on and people who are psychics and all this, this stuff that yeah. a lot of people, I've been called evil, you know, like this stuff's evil. And I, people tell me I'm going to hell and they're going to pray for me and my soul, things like that. You know, I get told all kinds of stuff, but I think it's funny that, you know, like, it's just like what you said, those people aren't my people and the, they're going to leave and make space for the, the people who are into that stuff. And one, I mean, I mean, I only have like 600 subscribers right now on YouTube, but, um, it's amazing. What I mean, it's it is it's the hardest one to grow, right? I'm like, why is this so hard? But um, this one woman, Tara Arnold, she channels she channels Saint Germain. She has seven thousand three hundred views right now, and she just was on a month ago. And I think it's because people are into it because I'm now I'm attracting you know, and, and hers is getting shared a lot. And it's like, okay, now I think she brought me like two hundred subscribers just on her own, just from her. <laughs> You know what I mean? And it's like the people who are into what you're sharing, um, they will find you. And then you can't worry about the ones who think you're crazy or think you're whatever. Everyone's got an opinion. No, you, half the people are going to hate us no matter what we do, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, I think I spent so many years of my life worrying about what other people th think about me that I'm like, yeah. you know what? I have evidence, a lot of evidence to prove that me trying to be something so other people like me doesn't bring me any fulfillment. So I may as well just go and do what the fuck I want because that's the only thing that's actually going to light me up. Um, and yeah, just, just why, you, you know, you could be strategic and create for them, but is that really what's going to set your soul on fire? Yeah. And I, f I feel like all, cause I know so many coaches too, like you could just, cause we're in this industry and they all say once they became intentional and vulnerable and just said, fuck it, what everybody thinks is when they, you know, they, they found their tribe and then they got more popular because people like, like you said, um, about the vibration of like of fear and shame and guilt being so low. Well, 
one of the highest vibrations vibrational frequencies there is is authenticity so people can tell like even if you think you're faking you're faking people out they can tell if you're real or or just trying to win them over just you know it's 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 not even worth your time people can smell that but something else that i i really noticed about you is just how the um how could you are empowering other women and i want all women to be like this because when we uplift each other you know it's 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 good for all of us instead of that competitive thing that i think a lot of uh females can get into is competing with each other and really there's we should all have this abundance mindset because like me having you on you do some of the same stuff i do there's going to be people who want to hire you different people who want to hire me you know there's no competition here because like i want to always uplift everybody on my show and and just it's there's no limit there's no limit like like to what we can have or what we can get there's you know there everyone can is going to get a piece of the pie and do you, do you want to talk at all about like an abundance mindset versus a lack mindset and that yeah, sure. Um, hmm. Why do you want to talk about that? I just, I just think it's empowering to people to, to, you don't have to, I just think it's empowering people to people to know, like when we help other people and uplift other people, when we're uplifters instead of competitors, I think that it just, yeah. it actually brings more to, you know, it's, it em it's empowering to, to other women when you, when you, when you empower them. It's, it's, I mean, it's not what I talk about because um, just business is not what I speak about online, even though I have a lot of clients that come to me for that. But it reminds me of when I was a personal trainer in a gym. I was in my, from 20 to 25, I was a really good personal trainer. And I moved to a new gym and you're kind of like the fresh meat. And I was in this big, uh, it was called Fitness First Platinum. And there was only four female trainers and the rest were male. So we kind of stand out like a sore thumb. Yeah. Everyone wanted to work with me. And I, one client knew me from an old gym that I used to work at, saw that I was there. I'd worked at like, like some of the top, uh, top, top gyms in Perth. And he was like, I want to start doing sessions with you. So I was like, great. Then one of the other female trainers had such like beef with me. It was became a huge problem. He was doing sessions with her, all the things. And this to me, as, as it was occurring, I hadn't ever done any of this work. I didn't know what abundance was, but it just didn't make any sense to me of like, I'm not trying to steal your client. Right. I'm not like in Mary Beth's Instagram trying to steal the people that are working with her or not being like, who's already got a trainer so I can take them away. I'm just there doing my thing, shining brightly, and some people are going to be attracted to that. Now, I don't own the client and you don't, I don't own my clients, you don't own your exactly. clients. And in my own personal evolution journey, I even recognize this as a person that did fitness. I had many different personal trainers in my time where I felt motivated to do boxing. So I went and got a boxing trainer. I wanted to do Pilates, got a Pilates trainer. And I wasn't feeling motivated because I'd seen the same person for six months straight and wanted a different energy and would change. And I realized this is just a natural part of life, even in coaching. I've had someone to help me with my business. I've had two really bad business coaches. <laughs> I've had two different women work with me on nervous system. I've had support with my relationship. They've all been different mentors and no one owns me. That yeah. for I always find it like I'm just so in my lane when it comes to the work that I do that I don't notice all the noise externally. But when someone's like, that's my client, I'm like, <laughs> coming from such a deep place of fear that there's not enough. That's exactly. Yeah, I could tell. That's why I asked you about that. It, you know, it was a surprise question, I guess, because I could just tell how you're just the opposite of that. And I just wish I wish all women could be more like you in that area. And I was just hoping you would give exactly I that I, answer. You know, I, I think as I'm getting, I'm like, I can't wait to see what I'm like when I'm an old lady. I'm just <laughs> like, people get concerned about shit that is so not important. Like there are billions of people on this planet. If you're a life coach and you support women to unpack shame and fully own themselves and love who they are and be authentic and show up powerfully to relationships, fucking every woman on this planet is a potential client. Like chill out. If you're good at what you do, you're never not going to be doing well because we have an invaluable skill set and women need support with this and want support with this. So just shine, focus on shining brightly 
Don't worry about who you think is potentially shining brighter than you, because if that's what you're looking for, you're probably always going to find it. That's true. Yeah. Comparison is the thief of joy. That's like a, such a true statement that quote, who I don't know who said it, but I love that. Because when we compare ourselves, um, it's just there's always going to be somebody doing better than us. And it's just it's just a silly it's just a silly thing to even focus on. And focus is so important. So back um, when you don't go within, you go without. So the, if, we're, if we're constantly oriented to the external world, and I know when I do this, because I can be so busy, I can spend a lot of time out here and I'll notice if if I'm like, oh, I should be doing better. And then I, then I have a look and all the things. I, the, in that moment, I'm like, I don't think this has got anything to do with Mary Beth doing better than me. Yeah, I think this has got a lot to do with my internal world not being tended to by myself because yes. we all like, what I beat everyone on the planet. I'm better than everyone. And then Oprah trumps me and I still didn't make it to the top. Like there's always going to be someone. So go internal when this shit showing enough in your life. I love that. Yeah. And it, it is like anytime we, we don't, we don't take responsibility for our own happy, our own happiness. And we, we give that to somebody else and we're giving them control over us too. Like now that person can control whether I'm happy or not. And that's always a inner work. What was that quote you said again? You said, when we don't go within, we go without. I love that. I've never heard that before. I'm going to steal in your material. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 it's not mine. I'd love it to be. Yes. It's quote Beck Antonucci on the end of that. No, I'm pretty sure. It's, I'm pretty sure it's Neil Donald Walsh from Ooh. the book Conversations with God. Uh, one of my favorite books ever, all three. I, I think, I think. I I'll, I'll, go, I'll Google it. I'll use my Google machine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Beck, thank you so much. I want to respect your time. I know it's morning for you. It's nighttime for me. And it's, it's that's so weird. And I almost I know, I'm to go get my coffee. I'm like, oh, I hope this is okay. It's like 7 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, uh, hello. I appreciate you getting up early and, and, and having this chat with me. And it's been so much fun. And I just love you. And um, do you want to let the viewers know like how, how they can reach you? Uh, what's the best way? Is it Instagram or what's your what's your Instagram? Instagram? Is Instagram's where I'm most accessible, where you'll find where you'll get direct communication with me. My team doesn't run it. Um, Instagram and or my podcast, Raw, Real and Vulnerable. Uh, and we release a new episode every Monday, Sunday for Americans, Sunday night. It's amazing. It's getting incredible feedback. So and good. It's, it's I love it. I'm really proud of of her and the impact she's creating in the world. So just come on over and dive in. And what I'm going to have all this for the viewers, I'm going to have all of her information in the show notes, but what is your Instagram handle in case anybody does, is going to be lazy and not read it? <laughs> at, at, at Beck Antonucci, but Beck with a K. Beck with a K. All right. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. And, and, and she really does answer your Instagram um, messages, you guys. So it's, I was, I was surprised. I was like, oh, you're just, it just shows how real and authentic you are. And the name of her podcast is Raw, Real, and Vulnerable Podcast. So with Beck Antonucci, see her name right there. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching. Um, please share and like this episode if you liked it. If it helped you, please share it with someone you know, especially if you know anybody who has genital herpes and they've shared it with you or herpes of any kind, I guess, you know, it's the shame's all the same. You know, go ahead and um, share this with anyone that you think it could help and make sure they follow back because she will she will help a lot with that shame and guilt and, you know, help help you guys get over it. So I really appreciate your time and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye, Beck. Bye.